Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible True series, we go through the Word together chapter and verse, and we're still in the book of Job. Uh, we're right about halfway, um, and, um, you know, I do know that the videos have been running long, because it just seems like that's kind of how you have to go through Job. You, you have to, you know, get to a stopping place that's um, doable. You know, um, it's not like the other parts of the word you can just do a couple chapters and then be done because you because it's addressing such um, passionate issues that it's it's like you, you you have to find a good stopping place at least that's the way it seems to me so um, I know that the, the videos have been running longer I think this one will probably be a little shorter because uh, I looked ahead at our subject matter uh, which by the way I should mention in chapter 20 uh, we do have uh, part of a phrase highlighted out there in verse 25, and uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll give a little brief overview when we get there. Um, you know the only reason we do that is because we don't know if you have little listening ears with you um, as we go through here. Um, and um, with that said, um, I just you know a couple thoughts going into this. We hit into the last one with Joe talking about hope, and you know he had said his hopes uh, disappeared. You know, and that's plural. And then he says, but my hope will go down with me to the grave. And we talked about how physically speaking, he's looking at his body and he probably does feel like he could, you know, um, just drop dead at, at any point because of his state that he's in. And so, you know, hope is an interesting subject. You know, we, you know, in our, our modern vernacular, you know, uh, we tend to use the word hope more like a wish, like, well, I, I hope it doesn't rain or you know, hope it's not too hot today, you know, um, and really a hope, a biblical hope is a confident expectation or a joyful anticipation. You know, it's a po hope is always a positive thing. And the word says that hope, our hope does not disappoint. Yet the Bible also says in the book of Proverbs, I believe it's Proverbs, it might be Psalms, but how a hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so then, you know, how can we grab a hold of you know, apprehend what, what the Bible's talking about when we say hope. And I think the first thing to address is that hope can be plural. In other words, what is my, what are my hopes, you know? And so like, I mean, I can, because it's a confident expectation, I can say, well, you know, we're going to go to the fair today. And so I have a hope, a confident expectation that I'm going to have funnel cake, you know, and, you know, there's, and, and just like if I had told my kids, we're going to go to the fair today and we're going to have funnel cake then they, you know, they're not going to be doubting my word. We're going to be driving there and they're going to be in the back seat with a confident expectation, a joyful anticipation that, yes, I'm going to the fair and I'm going to have funnel cake, you know, and so we can look at it that way. But really, you know, when we, when we examine what Job is talking about, when he says, my hopes have disappeared and part of his hope was that his legacy would go on through his children and he lost his children. So that's really what he's talking about. My hopes have disappeared, you know, um, and my 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 wealth has disappeared not that his wealth was more important to him than his children because I don't think it was I think that Job's thinking was that he wanted to provide an inheritance for his children a monetary inheritance so that that would help his legacy to go on through his children and uh, the reason I think that is because of how he handles his inheritance that he gives his children at the end of the book and we'll we'll see that when we get there but he's like, my hopes have disappeared, yet he also says, my hope will uh, go down with me into the grave. Well, what hope is that? He had said, he has this hope, I know my Redeemer, or my Redeemer lives. He'll say this, he will say that in, the, in chapter 19, but he also said, uh, I have a, if only there was a mediator between God and me. And he had said, my hope is in God, but he still has this fear that if he was to address God directly, that he, uh, his, you know, his his case would be, um, you know, overruled by God. And, uh, you know, we can see that he was, because he's like, even if I stood before God and brought my case, how can I contend with God? You know, and so, but yet he still has a desire to contend with God because he feels that uh, he has a case to present before God. But that in and of itself is, this is how I have to present my case to God. But no, God already knows his case. And God doesn't speak in the way that we always want him to. Now, uh, that all being said, I said that because he, he's talking about this hope and he makes the statement, my hope will go down with me to the grave. And he already said that his hope was in God 
um, justifying him, you know, vindicating him. And so he is speaking in terms that his friends have a hard time with, and we'll see that right now. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll jump in. Father, I thank you for this word. I ask that you would um, reveal your intent and your thought behind this word and help us to understand it and help us to uh, to examine the words that are being presented here in the book of Job. Help us to apply them where they need to be applied and help it, uh, help these words to strengthen our faith and to understand you better. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Okay, so Bil Bildad is going to respond in uh, chapter 18. Said, then Bildad the Shuhite replied, How long before you stop talking? Speak sense if you want us to answer. Do you think we are mere stupid animals? Do you, th or no, sorry. Do you think we are mere animals? Do you think we are stupid? You may tear out your hair in anger, but will that destroy the earth? Will it make the rocks tremble? In other words, will your anger alone change your circumstances? And I think that's one of the things that he, he is addressing a true point here is that people, I've seen it where people in the throes of grief or uh, when they feel like they have been treated unjustly, you know, it's like they just lean into their anger because they've, you know, it's like, well, just, you know, you f first of all, when you're angry, you feel justified just because you're angry because I must be, I must be uh, right because otherwise I wouldn't be angry, you know, and that's, that's a, um, that's a dangerous path, but yet people do, they want to, they, they, I've seen them persist in their anger just because, just because they're angry, their circumstances should change to something that is more to their liking or what they perceive as fair. And, uh, Bildad brings, the, you know, his point is right, is that you, you can't, you can't change the rocks. You can't change the earth or the way things work just because you're angry. And I do think that at this point, Job is angry. Uh, because we have we've been going for chapters and and we're still going to go for chapters where uh, there's an escalation that just keeps happening where his friends persist in this whole well you must have sinned and Job's gets I, I think Job's getting really angry about it um, and uh, they I think that they're getting angry with Job just because of the things he's saying because he is he is verbally processing out other you know these other th the reasons for the things that have been happening to him and it's just making his friends mad and Job's mad. And so it's, it's like, uh, I mean, I think it really does get to a point where it's like almost a shouting match, but that's a personal opinion of mine. They're still saying a lot of poetic things. And so, you know, maybe they have time to gather their thoughts enough to, to speak things out poetically. Usually when someone's in a shouting match, they're not doing that. But uh, he says, he's bringing up the, he's like, you're, what you're saying, Job doesn't even make any sense. Now, what Job is saying makes sense to us on this side of the cross, those of us who have spent time in the New Testament and seen that Jesus talked figuratively, spoken in, in, in uh, figurative terms. And uh, even Jesus' disciples had a hard time with Jesus' figurative speech. And he told them, there's time coming a time I'm going to stop talking figuratively to you. And then his very next statement, he started speaking things very plainly. He said, I came from the Father. And uh, now I'm going to go back to the Father. And, and he, he started speaking very plainly <clears throat> and not in figures of speech. And they were like, wow, now we know that you, we believe you know all things. <laughs> <coughs> because they, they didn't, you know, they had a hard time with speech that wasn't literal. And Job's friends are no exception. They're like, they're, they're like, what are you talking about, Job? It doesn't even make any sense. And it makes sense to us, but it doesn't make sense to them. And so we have to understand that. So then now in verse 5, he says, Surely the light of the wicked will be snuffed out. The sparks of their fire will not glow. Uh, the light in their tent will, not, will, will grow dark. The lamp hanging above them will be quenched. The confident stride of the wicked will be shortened. Their own schemes will be their downfall. The wicked will fall into a net. They fall into a pit. A trap grabs them by the heel. A snare holds them tight. A noose lies hidden on the ground. A rope is stretched across their path. Terrors surround the wicked and trouble them at every step. Hunger depletes their strength, and calamity waits for them to stumble. Disease eats their skin. Death devours their limbs. They are torn from their security by, of their homes and are brought down to the king of terrors. The homes of the wicked will burn down. Burning sulfur rains on their houses. So, okay, so now is this... Um, is this just uh, empty platitudes, or is Bildad actually speaking? And he, some of these things he are, he's saying here have actually happened to Job. Uh, you know, he did have 
burning fire destroy one of his houses coming down from heaven. Uh, the heavens, not heaven, but the heaven from the from the sky. Um, you know, he 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 is his skin is looking like it's wasting away. You know, these are things that uh, is is happening to they are happening to Job in real time. And yet Bildad is saying this is what happens to the wicked. So what Bildad is doing is he is not saying anything new. He's repeating the same thing that they've been saying to Job over and over again. And Job, and when you do that, you always run the risk of looking like you're not listening to what the person is telling you because they feel like uh, the cry of their heart is not being heard. Okay, so uh, now it is also true though that asking the same question over and over and over again um, for the purpose of trying to get a different answer uh, you know that that person should expect if the answer is truthful should expect to hear the same answer over and over and over again. Now, you know if you if you say um, uh, like like for instance as a parent your your kid might ask well can we uh, can can my friend come over you know and if and you as a parent say your friend can come over at two o'clock and they come back later because they're anxious and well can they come over earlier they can come over at two o'clock okay well what time can they did they just called and asked if they can come over earlier no they can come over at two o'clock and so if the answer is the answer then it doesn't need to change you know if if the truth is the truth um yet we should uh, be aware that if someone is asking the same question over and over again out of desperation that even if our answer is the same we should look to god for counsel and see if god is willing to state the same truth in a different manner that will help them to understand this is the answer because if we keep giving them the same exact answer in the same exact manner uh, without god's counsel we can run the risk of looking like we are not hearing the the uh the cry of their heart you know the need of their heart uh, that may be great and so we need to be aware of that uh, now uh, he's giving the same answer over and over again because it's a pre-programmed response and job sees through it you know sees through the trouble and so uh, verse 16 he continues their roots will dry up and their branches will wither all memory of their existence will fade from the earth no one will remember their names they will be thrust from light into darkness driven from the world they will have neither children nor grandchildren nor any survivor in the place where they lived people in the west are appalled at their fate people in the east are horrified they will say this was the home of a wicked person the place of one who rejected God. Now, I will say that at least Bildad is addressing Job uh, in terms that Job did use, because Job did say he was talking about his place. I'll go down to my place, you know, which in his mind, the only place left for him was the grave. Uh, But Bildad at least responds from, uh, this is the place uh, that you don't want to be, you know, but it is wrong in the sense that he is still saying this is the place of the wicked. Job is not the wicked. God said so in the first chapter of the book that God's, God did say, he, he said Job was blameless. So Job is not the wicked. And uh, But it's painful. It's like salt in the wound to say, well, uh, the wicked will have fire burn down their house. And that happened to Job. And, he, and it's also to also say, well, the wicked will have disease you know, uh, consume their skin. That has also happened to Job. So it's salt in the wound to say, because these things will happen to the wicked Job, and these things have happened to you, therefore you must be wicked. And that would be very difficult for somebody in Job's place to hear. And so then uh, Job's response is, is, uh, I mean, honest. I mean, maybe not, maybe not uh, gracious, maybe not, um, you know, uh, maybe not exactly how God would want him to answer, but his answer is honest. Because in chapter 19, it says, Then Job spoke again, How long will you torture me? How long will you try to crush me with your words? You have already insulted me ten times. You should be ashamed of treating me so badly. Even if I have sinned, that is my concern, not yours. And I, I, you know, this is a a defensive response. And but I mean, there is some truth to this statement is that the, the sin that a person has is really between them and God. You know, um, now we're not talking about there is a difference between passing judgment 
and pointing out an error. You know, and so how is judgment? See, a lot of Christians like might take this with their, you know, religious training and say, well, Jesus said, uh, you know, judge not. Um, and so, but if you really take the whole passage that Jesus is talking about there, is a, it's a warning against judgment because the amount of judgment that you apply is the amount of judgment that will come back upon you. And so really, but when Jesus was talking about, he, he didn't say, uh, you know, if, if your, your brother has a speck in his eye and you have a log in your own eye, he didn't say, therefore, don't try to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He said, first, remove the log from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so what Jesus was giving us was a warning against passing judgment flippantly. Um, and he gave us a, he, he told, because there are, there are times we have to judge a matter. The word says, if, some, if, if, if one of you is caught up in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. You can only do that by show, showing them, look at the sin that you've gotten yourself into. And the, but, but the point of it is not to say, look at this sin, uh, you, t you terrible sinner. You know, the point of it is, is to try to genuinely help. But the only way to do that is to first look past our own hangups and realize that I, I myself am subject to God. So I need to remove any potential stumbling block out of my life and understand that I am also a person who is not perfect. So when I go to talk to my brother or sister who is caught up in a fault, then I need to examine my own heart first before I go talk to them. I need to examine my motives for, for doing it because judgment uh, is something that can come back upon us if we're doing it for the wrong reason or we're, or, you know, we're doing it out of pride. And so he's like, if I have sinned, that's between me and God. And it is on, on, you know, on a, on a personal level, a person's sin is between them and God. But again, you know, Jesus gave us that progression. If your brother sins against you, go to him personally. If he won't listen, when you go personally, take a couple witnesses. If he, if he still won't listen, take it before the church. And it's for the purpose of helping that person to get back right with God. It's not for the purpose of uh, just, you know, shaming them into repentance because the end justifies the means, because the end does not justify the means. And so that's kind of, you know, what's happening here is, well, Job, you should just, you're obviously wrong somewhere. You should just repent, you know, and uh, they're not right about that. And so verse five, he says, you think you're better than I am using my humiliation as evidence of my sin. That's exactly what he did. He's like, you're saying that I, that because of these outward circumstances, because I've lost my children, because my house is burned down, because I, because I lost all my flocks, because my, my body is full of this uh, dis-ease, these sores and everything, you're saying that, those are, that that in itself is evidence that I've sinned. And he, he's, he's very, it's very um, well put, what Job just said. He, 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 he hit the, the nail right on, on the head. But verse six, he says, but it is God who has wronged me, capturing me in his net. Now that statement's incorrect <laughs> because again, Job doesn't realize that there is an adversary and we've, we've stated that many times and that's all we need to say about that. He's, he's, God has not done this to him. So verse seven, I cry out help, but no one answers me. I protest, but there is no justice. God has blocked my way, so I cannot move. He has plunged my path into darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He has demolished me on every side, and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. His fury burns against me. He counts me as an enemy. His troops advance. They build up roads to attack me. They camp all around my tent. So again, his place, where I am, my tent. Verse 13, my relatives stay far away, and my friends have turned against me. He's right about that. My family is gone. Also right. And my close friends have forgotten me. My servants and maids consider me a stranger. I am like a foreigner to them. When I call my servant, he doesn't come. I have to plead with him. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I am rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I stand to speak, they turn their backs on me. My close friends detest me. Those I loved have turned against me. I have been reduced to skin and bones and have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Verse 21, have mercy on me, my friends, have mercy. 
Okay, so his his cry for mercy, you know, uh, thank you, is to to his friends. Have mercy on me, you know. Look at you know. Don't instead of you, instead of looking at this this all of this that's befallen me, look on this and have mercy on me. Don't look at it as evidence that I've sinned. Instead, have mercy. And really, he's right. You know, uh, when we see people, so we we can apply this. When we see people who have lost everything and everything, and, and even if we know mentally uh, that their actions caused this to happen, because many times that's true, they're, through their own actions, they have lost everything. Um, we can mentally say, okay, well, we can see and understand logically why this has come upon them, but we shouldn't say, aha, they got they got what they deserved, or or well, you know, they, they they got themselves into this sin, and there's and and it's just it's just very sad. But really, at that point, we're supposed to reach out to them with mercy and with grace, and help them to see that there's a God who cares about them. Okay, so he says, uh, verse twenty-one again: "Have mercy on me, my friends. Have mercy, for the hand of God has struck me." Must you also persecute me like God does? Haven't you chewed me up enough? Oh, that my words could be recorded. Oh, that they could be inscribed on a monument, carved with an iron chisel and filled with lead, engraved forever in rock. And actually they are, because we're reading them. <laughs> you know, um, and so, but the other thing to point out here is that he, he now, I mean, he's like, because they, because they keep, you know, um, implying and implying and implying what they're implying, it's causing him to, uh, his words against God be, to become harsher and harsher. And really, honestly, it's possible. And we, we, we talked about this before, how uh, he, uh, Moses said things that were wrong. And it, if you go back and you look, there was a, a certain point when the, when the Israelites had um, uh, tormented him enough that it says that it, 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 in the bitterness of, uh, of the soul, he, he spoke things he shouldn't say. And that's going to happen, you know. That's why that's why you don't you don't escalate a situation because when people get angry enough, they will say things in that moment of anger, or that moment of high emotion that they would not otherwise say, and they probably don't even mean. And so we see, you know, it's you know we can look at this in black and white, and we can look at this in on, on paper and ink, and we can say, man, Job's saying some. Some, you know, he, he's like God's pursuing him. God's made him a target. God's done this and God's done that. And be like, man, you know, uh, Job believes some bad things about God. Well, we have to understand the escalation of the moment and say, well, it's possible. And God did say that, that Job and his friends said things about him that were inaccurate. And they did. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they meant everything they were saying in the moment that they said it, because I think all of us have gotten into some kind of heated argument, some kind of heated debate, and threw off a few zingers that we really didn't mean and later regretted. And so we we have to uh, take that knowledge and at least layer that over this and say, it's possible that this is what's happening. And if that is the case, that Job is saying things against God that he doesn't really mean, he's just saying out of bitterness of soul, God knows that. God knows if we said something that we don't really mean, because God knows all things. So we have to uh, take that into account. And so verse 25, But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And so, you know, you get to these moments where Job is it looks like he's on this downward spiral and he's saying things that he shouldn't say, yet all of a sudden he will speak something out that is an allusion to Jesus who was to come because he is speaking out of a need. Okay, and God meets needs. And so God is is allowing this to come up out of Job's speech, these moments. And so again, we have to remember that just because somebody says something wrong and then later says something right, if God has them to say something that's not a stamp of approval on their character and it's not a stamp of approval on every other th everything that they've ever said. Because again, I'll bring out Caiaphas, who was the high priest at that time when Jesus was about to be crucified, and he was one of the ones who was the instigator of Jesus being crucified. And he said, uh, it's expedient for one man to die for the nation. And the Bible says plainly, he did not say this on his own, but because he was high priest that year, he prophesied about Jesus' death. 
And so he was a wicked person, but because of his office and his station, God spoke through him. That's not God putting a stamp of approval on Caiaphas' his whole life. It's just simply him bringing something out that needs to be said and needs to be uh, public enough that it can stand as a witness of, of what God was going to do through Jesus. And so it's the same thing here. He speaks, out, he speaks out this statement, I know my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And so that is a prophetic statement. We've said before that some of the things that Jesus there that he has said about Jesus were not really a prophetic statement. It was more like an allusion to what was to come, a hint at something, a foreshadow. But in this case, this is a prophetic statement because Jesus did stand on the earth, and he is the Redeemer. And so... Uh, why is he saying my redeemer? Because he is he is needing he is in need of redemption. You know, and not just be, it's not really he has not uh, directly sinned. He asked God, you know, why not forgive me? And so then we know that in the past he is accustomed to being forgiven and and knowing he was forgiven by God for things that he had done wrong. In this particular case, he has not done something wrong, so he's not need in need of redemption from sin in the sense that. Uh, sin happened in this moment or this instant it's it's more like he he needs redemption from all the words that are being spoken against him because words that are spoken against us do weigh on us and uh and it's and also redemption from everything that he has lost because to redeem means to buy back and so god is not god does restore but he he is in the business of going a step beyond just restoration but he actually buys us back from uh, this, the actions that we take that, that uh, alienate us from God. And so Jesus actually bought us back from destruction. And so he's like, I know that my Redeemer lives. In verse 26, and after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. And so, so what he's doing now is, He's kind of fleshing out that earlier statement that he made is that when I go to the grave, my hope will go with me. He wasn't saying that my hope will will end there. You know, he, so he's actually making some some statements here that are like really revolutionary for the time and the place. And that's why they keep saying, you're not making any sense because he is like, I, even though after my, my body has decayed, he's like, I know that I'll see God for myself because my Redeemer lives. And so this is, he, Job might not even fully understand what he's talking about. Um, but yet, it is true, <laughs> you know. So he's, he continues in verse 27, Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Amen. How dare you go on persecuting me, saying, It's his own fault. You should fear punishment yourselves, for your attitude deserves punishment. Then you will know that there is indeed a judgment. And so, uh, you know, um, in a different translation, it talks about wrath. He's like, you should, because wrath brings the sword. A punishment and so that again is a hint that I mean this is almost a shouting match they're like just in wrath at, at, at Job because of what he's saying because he's I mean he's saying things that they are not happy about the things really what we could say is they're unhappy about it because they don't want to think about it you know they want to just continue on in their doctrine they want to just you know just uh, you know have day in day out you know and 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 uh, and people a lot of people want that, you know, they, they just want um, to live a normal life, so to speak. And Job's bringing up questions that are shaking them out of that comfort, that comfort zone. And uh, so, but what's interesting about this is he's like, your attitude deserves punishment. And so it's, and I mean, it is possible to have a bad attitude. It's possible to present the Bible with a bad attitude. It's possible to take the words of God and present it with a bad attitude attitude and our attitude can make us wrong because if we're not saying it the way that the Lord in a way in which God approves then we're not properly representing him and the Bible calls us ambassadors for God and so if I'm going to be an ambassador for God that means I need to spend time in his presence and learn how he addresses things and learn what his heart is so that I will have something to draw from uh, in terms of attitude and how I am presenting his word. Okay, so um, chapter 20. Then Zophar the Namathite replied, I must reply because I am greatly disturbed. I have had to endure your insults. 
but now my spirit prompts me to reply. And, and the other translation says, I've heard a rebuke. You know, but yeah, Job rebuked them. He, he's rebuked them to their face because he's like, you're handling this wrong. And he's right about that. <laughs> you know, um, and so verse four, he says, don't you realize that from the beginning of time, ever since people were first placed on the earth, the triumph of the wicked has been short lived and the joy of the godless has been only temporary. Though the pride of the godless reaches to the heavens and their heads touch the clouds, yet they will vanish forever, thrown away like their own dung. Those who knew them will ask, where are they? They will fade like a dream and not be found. They will vanish like a vision in the night. Those who once saw them will see them no more. Their families will never see them again. Their children will beg from the poor, for they must give back their stolen riches. Though they are young, their bones will lie in the dust. So then, uh, he, so what's he saying? Um, I mean, re really, I mean, it's still repetitive. He's not, you know, bringing out any revelation here. Uh, he's still saying the same thing they've been saying to Job since the beginning. But he is addressing this idea of eternal life that Job has brought up again. Um, because he, he doesn't, it's not computing with them. You know, Job says, you know, what, what, what Job is hinting at with that statement that, as for me, my Redeemer lives, He'll stand upon the earth at last, after my body is decayed, yet my yet in my body I will see God, I will see him for myself. And so, remember, their doctrine, and we know this from what Job has said himself, is that uh, if once a person dies and they go to the place of the dead, it's like they're sleeping. You know, it's like there's no consciousness. You know, that's that's a very strong doctrine in their in their time and their place. And so this is why what Job is saying is really upsetting to them. So what he is saying here is he's like, the, the wicked, once they die, he's like, there's no coming back. There's no, there, there's no, I will see uh, my redeemer again. You know, once you die, that's it. That's, that's the end. You know, that's, that's what he said. He's not saying because their doctrine is not the cessation of existence, but it is a cessation of consciousness. So, um, so, so far, even though he's not bringing any revelation up, what we do see in his response is that his doctrine is being challenged and he is mad about it. And so uh, difficult questions will always offend a religious mindset. And by that I mean uh, a mindset that is locked into its traditions that have the form of godliness but deny the power of God. You know, that, that says you should just, you should, you shouldn't ask these questions. You should just, you know, you should just be happy with this is the way it is. And you should, that should just be enough, you know, and Job, because of the way that things transpired for him, he is having to reject that way of thinking, um, or I should say he is rejecting that way of thinking. And, uh, we've seen why, so I won't elaborate further. So then, um, Verse 12, he says, They enjoyed the sweet taste of wickedness, letting it melt under their tongue. They savored it, holding it long in their mouths. But suddenly the food in their bellies turned sour, of poisonous venom in their stomach. They will vomit the wealth they swallowed. God won't let them keep it down. They will suck the poison of cobras. The viper will kill them. They will never again enjoy streams of olive oil or rivers of milk and honey. They will give back everything they worked for. Their wealth will bring them no joy. For they oppressed the poor and left them destitute. They foreclosed on their homes. They were always greedy and never satisfied. Nothing remains of all the things they dreamed about. And so this is a passive-aggressive statement. Um, they have just generally before this said, well, this is the fate of the wicked. But now he is giving some details. At, so it's like this: these things, this is the fate of the wicked for or because they oppressed the poor and left them destitute. They foreclosed on their homes. They were always greedy and never satisfied. And um, so then this is a passive aggressive statement it is an implication that Job has done these things. Um, because Job was extremely wealthy, we can assume that he probably was a landlord. You, you know, um, did he have within himself, within his resources, the means to do this, to foreclose on people's homes, to take uh, things that weren't his. Yeah, he did. He, he he was the he was the most wealthy man of that region, and he certainly had a great influence um, among the people. We see that he talks about it later, and so he could have done those things. And we we also know he did not because God Himself witnessed of Job that he was a man who shunned evil. He didn't do those things. 
Um, and so what they are doing there here is that they are they are groping, they are looking for some because they 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 can't get past this idea that Job somehow sinned because they won't dismiss their doctrine. And so they're like, we they, he must have done something. Okay, well if we can't prove what he did, what is something he may have possibly been able to do? You know, it's like a it, that's why I say it's a it's a it's an implication that he has done these things. And we will see actually that later on the friends will start to build upon this idea that Zof that Zophar has now presented in a general way, but later they will build upon that and they will continue to use that against him, even though he's not done that. So then uh, the last part of verse 20, nothing remains of all the things they dreamed, they dreamed about. Nothing is left after they finish gorging themselves. Therefore, their prosperity will not endure. In the midst of plenty, they will run into trouble and be overcome by misery. May God give them a belly full of trouble. May God rain down his anger upon them. When they try to escape an iron weapon, a bronze tipped arrow will pierce them. The, the arrow is pulled from their back and the arrowhead glistens. Now I did highlight the last part of that phrase out there. Um, you know, and the idea of, uh, of, of blood comes up again uh, within it or gall. You know, um, and uh, Job talked about that earlier when he said, let not the ground cover my, my blood. And he was saying, so in other words, let my cry for justice continue on even while I'm living. Because in Abel's case, Abel had passed away. Um, and, you know, you can go back to the previous episode, I think, that we talked about that if you want more information upon uh, on, on that. But so he says, um, so the, the idea that it's like this, this, uh, this, because Job had said, let my, let my, uh, blood continue to cry out for justice or that's the paraphrase of what he said he is saying now that he is he, he, so far as also using that same um, that same object lesson the blood but he's saying that it's the blood of the wicked therefore it's justified there's no uh, it can't cry for justice because that that person is not uh, worthy of justice you know and so that's what I think that Zophar means by this. In other words, the 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 arrow that struck, uh, it, 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 the arrow itself is right, it, and it should have struck, is what he's saying. Where as Job is saying, I'm being, I've been struck um, unjust, uh, unjustly, and it was unjust for Satan to do that. And again, when God gave from Satan permission to do it in order to prove the point, even with the permission that Satan had acquired, he didn't have to carry it out. He didn't have to destroy everything that Job had. That was a, his own choice to do that. Okay. And it's like, yes, uh, God could have stopped him. But once again, in order to prove the point to the heavenly court that you cannot overcome a person's free will and free choice to serve God, no matter what happens, God allowed that to show, uh, show forth that truth to the heavenly court that you can't, it, it, there's always going to be somebody whose will will not break. And Job is, the, is one of those people that no matter, it didn't matter what happened to him. It didn't matter. He, he wasn't, he, he may say some wrong things about God, but he's not going to abandon God. You know, um, he's not going to um, rethink his devotion to God just because of it. He, even though all his friends are uh, insisting he must be guilty, even though they're saying all these terrible things, Job's will cannot be overridden. And that is the point. That is why God allowed it to happen to prove that. And we've we've talked about that before. But it's a it's a good point to to remind ourselves of because it's just, you know you go through all this talk and it's like why God why did God allow this to happen? It was to prove the point that a person's will cannot be overridden even by Satan. So um, he continues here uh, in the last part of verse twenty five. The terrors of death are upon them. Verse 26, their treasures will be thrown into the deepest darkness. A wildfire will devour their goods, consuming all that they have left. The heavens will reveal their guilt, and the earth will testify against them. A flood will sweep away their house. God's anger will descend on them in torrents. This is the reward that God gives the wicked. It is the inheritance decreed by God. And so the closing thought here is that Zophar brings up the idea of inheritance, where Job had brought that up a while back. You know, we, we talked about that. And as far as Job was concerned, his inheritance was his legacy in that um, the, 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 the ongoing of his family line, his lineage. That was very important to people in that time and place. We saw it with Abraham, and we see it with Job as well. And um, so he's like, uh, in other words, he's, he's saying, because, the, you know, because we've already decided that Job is wicked, 
um, th these things, Job, this is what happens to the wicked, and this is why, because they, they have taken things that aren't theirs, and, and therefore you, you probably did that. You know, and, and I'm paraphrasing what so far is saying, but he is saying, this is the inheritance of the wicked. Therefore, you should, the implication is, therefore, you should repent. You know, and, um, you know, it's, they, they're, they are addressing the things that Job is saying. It may look like they're not, um, but their mistake is that they continue in that same repetitive uh, thing and Job is Job. It didn't work before. It's not going to work again. So anyway, let's go ahead and pray, um, and then we will see Job's response in the next episode. So Father, I thank you for this word. I do thank you that we can learn a lot about what not to say. Um, you know when we should hold our peace, when we should uh, look to you for counsel about what should be said and what should not be said. Um, you know I, I thank you, Father, that you do care for people and that uh, this point was proven that no one can overpower somebody's will you're the only one who could father and you never will you will never override a person's will and so it's comforting to know that uh, no matter what happens to us we can choose to have an unbreakable will and we can unite our will with your will and we can make your word our word and we can continue in those things and never be shaken and I thank you for that, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.